Seven years ago, I made a video demonstrating Saints Row 1 running on the PC using the Xbox 360 emulator Xenia. It was barely playable to say the least. But today it looks like this, nearly flawless and perhaps better than running natively on the console. So today let's walk you through how to play Saints Row 1 on the PC. Okay, first things first, we gotta get you a copy of Saints Row 1. Hmm, now where could we possibly get such a thing? It's not like... I've been seeding Saints Row 1 for over a decade. I'm sure you'll find a copy somewhere cheap like GameStop or eBay. Oh, I'm just kidding. Go to my Saints Row page, download a copy of the ISO, and place it into a dedicated folder. Alright, now let's download Zinnia Canary. Links will be in the description for that. And now with Zinnia extracted into its own folder, start the program and then close it. This will generate a config file that we have to modify. Right click this file and open it with the text editor of your choice. Now scroll down to the memory section and change the value of protect0 to false. And that's it. That's the only modification you need to make. Plug in your controller, open the Saints Row 1 image with Xenia, and enjoy the game that started it all. You might see a texture glitch here and there, the audio might desync a bit in the cutscenes, but this could just be unique to me because my PC fails to meet the spec. My PC is basically a potato and it still works for me, so I'm sure it will work for you. If things are running a bit choppy, you can try changing these settings in that config file to optimize things a bit more. But changing protect zero to false is the absolute key to stop this game from crashing every three seconds and makes the game completely playable from start to finish. Saints Row 1 was never really optimized that well even on consoles to begin with, so what's interesting is that while audio desyncing is definitely a problem on the emulation side, I found that in general the actual gameplay is significantly smoother than playing on an Xbox 360. It's nowhere near as choppy in the open world as the actual console, and for that I feel that playing Saints Row 1 on the PC is the preferable way to play. So if you're one of the many Saints Row fans that never got to experience the first game because it was an Xbox exclusive, you can finally cross this game off your list. Well wasn't that easy, but I'm not just going to leave you guys there. Technically with that tutorial you can play all kinds of 360 games now. But now that we've got Saints Row 1 on the PC, let's do a bit more with it. In 2020, Emus discovered something quite interesting about Saints Row 1. By modifying one byte in the main executable of Saints Row, a developer console window would appear. Then by branching off the main controller input function to include the uncalled for keystroke handler, the device input functionalities for the keyboard would then be enabled as well. Thus altogether letting you type in commands with your keyboard to modify values of the game in real time. This is where we run into a bit of a problem on the emulation side of things. The keyboard by default acts as a disgusting flattened out Xbox controller and not actual key press inputs. Now in an older version of Xenia, you could simply include the property keyboard pass through equals true in that config file we just edited and it would treat the keyboard the same way a 360 would. But currently, this feature has been removed from newer versions of Xenia, though I hear they plan to add it back in for a later build. For now, to circumvent this, you'll either need to download an older version of Xenia or use God's Hand's hacked version of a more up-to-date build. Things are only going to get more involved from here, so check the description for reference. Now, assuming you have a build of Xenia that can accept keystrokes as actual keyboard values, let's continue. In the root folder of Xenia, create a new folder called Patches. Download the patch files from my site and place them in this folder. Now, when you start up Saints Row, you should see Patches Applied in the window description. When you enter the main menu, the console window will be enabled, and if you're able to type, that means Xenia is passing the keystrokes through and everything is working. Congratulations, you've got yourself a very powerful tool at your disposal. But speaking of disposal, how do we get this thing off the screen? Well, that's easy, you just press the escape key. Well then, now how do we get it back? Yeah. See, the patch file just activates a switch when the game is ran. We tell Xenia to turn that value on, the menu comes on, and now that we've closed it, there's no way to bring it back unless we restart the game and let Xenia reapply the patch. So to have control over this directly, we need to use a memory editor like Cheat Engine so we can change the value on the fly in real time. So hook into Xenia, add the corresponding address, and set the data type to be a byte. 1 turns it on, 0 turns it off. Phew! That was pretty convoluted and to be honest, completely optional. If you just want to tinker around with the console, you don't have to use Cheat Engine, but that console window can be an eyesore, so that's how you turn it on and off. Alright, now let's actually use this thing. If you've ever used a terminal before, it works the same as any other. You type a command, optionally with some parameters, and hit enter. It has tab completion so you can type a partial command, hit tab, and it will fill out the rest, 
There's a search command if you're looking for anything vague, and I have a list of all the commands on my website if you need a reference. Be warned, some of them crash the game, some of them don't do anything at all, but there's so much you can do! Set crouch walk speed to 200, enable trigger pratfalls, and you can just shoot yourself around the map. You can teleport, you can use fine aim, there's so much cool stuff. But we're not just gonna stop there. We're going to go a little deeper into things now and begin modifying the game files directly. There's a lot to cover here, and while I'm going to try and be thorough to keep everyone up to speed, everything past this point will require some mental effort, and it's not meant to be a complete spoon-fed tutorial. I'll guide you along with some reference, but most of the heavy lifting will be done by you. So for those of you brave enough to continue, let's dive deeper. If you downloaded the ISO, you'll have to extract that. If you downloaded the pre-extracted version, you're good to go. This is what an Xbox game looks like on the inside. This default.xdx file is a file you can think of as an executable for the 360. It's what launches the game with its functions and settings and all that. When we opened up the console window, our patch file was overriding a value in this file. Caboose, God's Hand, and Illusion have figured out a way to make Saints Row run at 60 FPS by modifying this file. You can basically throw as many modded XEX files as you want in here and start the game up in different ways. The data folder holds all the game's music, the video folder holds all the main menu videos, but the pack files are what holds all the game's assets and scripts. As the name suggests, there are a bunch of files packed together similar to a zip file, except using Volition's own compression format. In other words, the files inside aren't easily accessible by design. A fine man named Gibd reverse engineered their compression format and created a tool to extract these files. This is the main driving force behind the Saints Row 2 mod, Gentlemen of the Row. Thankfully for us, Volition uses this compression format for all their games, and so Gibbs' extraction tools happen to work for Saints Row 1 as well. Interesting side note, Gibbs is also a contributor to Zinnia. What a talented guy. So on my Saints Row page, you can download my personal setup for how I use his tools. Place the folder in the root of the Saints Row game folder, open it in a new window, and now we're going to add the MISC and MISC2 files into the input folder. These files together are where most of the main game files are. Now click on Unpack and it will automatically run everything into the extractor while moving the files into a backup folder. Next, open the Workspace folder, and I'll show you a much better way of how to go about modding these files in a minute, but just to show you a very quick demonstration of the process, I'm going to open up MISC2, I'm going to search for drugs.xtbl and open it with a text editor. Here we can see it's basically a markup file and the table holds the data for consumable items. I'm going to change the price of the bong to zero, and I'm also going to copy the health regeneration effects of food items onto the bong as well. Now I'm going to save the file, and then I'm going to click on Pack. And now we don't have to do anything else, we just have to start the game, go to brown baggers, and as you can see the value has changed so the item is now free, and sure enough doing drugs refills the health like food items. Now there's a much better way of editing these X table files. In 2013, when Volition still had a modicum of respect, they released a special editor for these Xtable files as part of their Kinsey's Toy Box mod tools. I've included these files in the extra folder. It's kind of buggy because it tries to look for associated files within its own root as opposed to the source file, so you need to move everything into the actual folder for it to work. For convenience, I've created this batch file and all it does is move everything into and out of the MISC folder. So double click on this and in the MISC folder, sort by date and open the editor. Now let's open drugs.xtbl again, and as you can see, this is a much better way to work with these files. It includes all the associated data for any file it references, and so now we have a nice drop-down menu of compatible values, so you don't have to manually look for everything yourself. This time, let's open weapons.xtbl, and let's change the firing sound effect of the AK to sex noises, give it a large magazine, and add some knockback. Let's change the pipe bomb model to be a donut. Did you know the liquor bottle is technically a weapon with an explosion effect? Let's change that to have the explosion of a Learjet. Let's make a grenade launcher that shoots donuts. Man, I really love exploding donuts. You get the idea. There's a lot of modifications you can make within these Xtable files that affect the behavior of the game. We're just scratching the surface. But now it's time to explain how to go about saving these changes. So you might be wondering what's the difference between the MISC and MISC2 files. MISC holds mission scripts and game settings. MISC2 holds game textures and the exact same game settings. Usually MISC2 overwrites what's in MISC1 and those settings are what you see in the game. But sometimes not. So when you save your modded tables, it's a good idea to then go into the second folder, search for the exact same file, and overwrite it there as well. Then we need to once again click on that batch file and it will move the table editor back into its home folder. Once again repack and hopefully if the game doesn't crash, enjoy your new personalized game settings. Some other examples of what you can do with this are make custom homies, custom weapons, swap cutscene actors around, 
and much, much more. That basically covers X tables. Now let's check out the mission scripts. Those are in the Lua files with abbreviated gang names. Let's briefly look at the first mission and see how it works. When you start the mission, the function tss01start is called. Right away we can see that it copies all your inventory items and ammo into an array and then removes them. Then it calls enter church trigger as a new thread and begins to play the cutscene. While this is happening, the player's health is refilled and then a callback function is set so the player loses when they have 25% of their health left. Then the player is teleported to player church start, which is the graveyard we end up in when the cutscene ends. This string is referencing coordinates data that's located in the .cts file that shares the same name as the mission. These kinds of files also include locations for NPCs, save locations, spawn locations, CD locations, pretty much anything that's a trigger or otherwise has a specified location in the game. There's a nifty console command called warp to nav and you can type in most nav point string values into it and warp all over the map. When it comes to mission nav points, they'll only work when a mission is loaded. So back in the mission Lua, if we replace this value with, let's say, this generic nav point to the airport, sure enough, when the cutscene ends, it takes us to the airport before it fails us instantly. This is because there's a game loop that is constantly checking the distance of the player in relation to that original spawn point. Delete all that, and now there's no pesky game logic keeping us in bounds. Another interesting function is stop exploit. After the main saints respond, they're then turned invulnerable. They're then turned into idle civilians that just stand there, then if they take damage from any source, stop exploit is called. Here they turn into hostile members of the Vice Kings and attack the player. So we can take away the invulnerability for them, or we can change what happens when they get hit. How about, when we start the mission, we take them to the airport with us, and if they detect any damage, they start fighting each other. Blood in, blood out, bitch. A lot of the functions that get called in these mission scripts can be found in the uglib file. There's even a function to open and close the drawbridge. The fun part is you're not just limited to using some of these in missions. In the mission global file, we can call the trigger enable function so that it spawns custom triggers. Here I've added two triggers to open and close the drawbridge. And now I've got a car launcher. Ah, sweet beautiful destruction. To quickly wrap things up, let's do some texture editing. Remember that CMesh file? That holds all the clothes for the player. Let's extract that the same way we did the other pack files and take a look inside. All the textures are bundled in the peg files. For this example, I'm going to take all the peg files of the GameStop shirt, and we can extract them the same way as the pack files. Place the files you want to unpack in the input folder, and once again, click on unpack. And in our workspace folder, they'll appear in the peg folder. As you can see, they're just UV textures in DDS format. They can be repainted in Photoshop, saved under the DXT1 format, and when you're ready to repack things, they'll be moved into this output folder where you'll have to manually replace them back into the folder they came from. Finally, repack the pack file and enjoy your custom threads. Alright, that should give you guys plenty of ways to play around with this game. I have to give a huge shout out to God's Hand for being the OG Saints Row modder and helping me immensely with the creation of this video. This video doesn't scratch the surface, he's been really pushing this game to its limits. He's made plugins that integrate IRC and Discord chats into the game, he's made a Twitch Play Saints Row plugin that lets Twitch viewers activate scripts in the game, and he's been reverse engineering the game in hopes of bringing more functionality to it. Shout out to SaintsRow.net, shout out to SR1MP, shout out to The Row, shout out to all the OG players keeping this scene active and alive. The most neglected and ignored fanbase in the entire series remains to be the most dedicated. Doing the most creative shit to keep a game they love alive and for others to discover and enjoy as well is what it's all about. Truly the community is what keeps this awful series fun for me. No thanks to Volition. They can sit over here in the corner of shame. So what does the future hold? A lot of exciting things. Currently there's an ongoing effort to bring multiplayer functionality to Xenia and Saints Row. Official Xenia developers have been helping with this. Members of the Halo and Burnout communities have been helping with this as they are also trying to bring back online functionalities for their respective communities as well. On the Saints Row side, God's Hand has been spearheading this effort and has made some notable progress. He's already made a custom ISO that re-enables the gang server, and then created his own online leaderboard, inching us closer and closer to the goal of Saints Row Online. Definitely check out his channel where he's releasing devlogs and tutorials of him reverse engineering the game. That stuff is fun to watch. It's very possible we are living in a reality in which Saints Row 1 on PC becomes more stable than Saints Row 2 on PC. It's already got more support. Anyways guys, that's it. Go have some fun with this. Check the description for further information and subscribe to my channel for further developments. See you next time.